Hey, good morning. Well, no, actually, good afternoon. So, I'm setting up for tour discussion here at um, Fort Mott, New Jersey. Currently sitting on top of Battery Arnold, a 12 inch gun battery. So, I have a beautiful view of the river. I can just uh, spin the old tripod around. That's the Delaware River. That's the harbor, harbor defenses of the Delaware we'll be talking about today. And a series of forts here, including Fort Mott, where I'm sitting, that guarded the Delaware River and uh, provided security for ports of Wilmington, Chester, Camden, Philadelphia, shipyards at Philadelphia and Camden, industrial centers, etc. So, coastal batteries, harbour defences. We're going to be talking about those today. Beautiful day out here. Hence the hat and the sunglasses. Seersucker shirt. It's a typical mid-Atlantic summer's day. Um, warm, humid. I'm lucky because I'm getting a breeze off of the river which is coming up um, the Delaware estuary from the Atlantic so I'm getting a nice breeze on me but Still a punishingly hot day. So, recommendations. If you're touring a battlefield or a historic site, taking a hike around these places, always remember, bring water. Bring more water than you think you'll need. Hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. So, sometimes we forget that. We bring that like, one 16 ounce bottle of uh, spring water that we purchased from the Wawa on the way up, and uh, that's going to be insufficient on a day like this. So, I've got my 32 ounce REI bottles, I've got three of those in the car loaded with water, so I'm pretty, I'm pretty good to go. Okay, coming up on 1300 Eastern, so I do not know what that is in your time zone. One o'clock in the afternoon, my time zone, so. I guess it's uh, like old Cliff Mitchell Moore and Gene Metcalf. If it's one o'clock in New Jersey and it's twelve o'clock in Newfoundland, home and away, it's time for two-way family favourites. Now, with a song in my heart. No. So before I get completely carried away and going down memory lane on the uh, night program, um, let's talk about Fort Mott, New Jersey. So. I'm sitting here on top of Battery Arnold, one of the um, five batteries at this fort. This was a 12-inch gun battery, the one I'm particularly sitting on. Um, if I can move around later, I will. As you can see behind me, there's a rail fence which provide, prevents me, safety-wise, getting too close to the insane drop-off into the uh, gun well behind me. So, safety first. Uh, going to do a talk first and then we'll see how far we can move around and if we can't move around that much because of safety concerns bearing in mind I'm actually sitting on the top of the fort at the moment um, we'll shoot some static video from the tripod and we'll add that on the end of the live stream um, to the Facebook page underneath the event so however we do that that's how we're gonna that's how we're going to proceed. We're going to proceed safely. So I'm at Fort Mott, Delaware, um, not Delaware, Fort Mott, New Jersey, on the Delaware River. So it's Mott, M-O-T-T. -T. Um, I'm technically in Pennsville Township, so that's Salem County, right in the south of uh, New Jersey. As I say, along the Delaware River, across the other side of the river is Delaware, upriver is uh, Pennsylvania. And you hit Philadelphia, upriver. So. That's where we're located. Um, at Fort Mott, what you said, is it's part of the harbour defences of the Delaware River. So that's a system of forts that were to protect particularly the uh, ports upriver. So that would be Wilmington, Delaware, um, Chester, Pennsylvania, Camden, New Jersey, and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, um, significant ports even going back to the colonial period, 17th, 18th century, um, later industrial centres, also shipyards. Um, if anybody's a World War II buff, you'll note the number of 
aircraft carriers and battleships that were turned out up in Philadelphia. In fact, if you go up to Camden, New Jersey today, the USS New Jersey, uh, Iowa class battleship is a museum ship up there today. So you can get an aircraft carrier and you can get a battleship up this river. So it's a broad river, it's a deep river. And um, if you were the bad guys, you'd possibly want to come up this river and uh, throw some artillery onto these ports and onto these towns and centers of industry. So you want to protect against that and so consequently there's been a system of forts along this river since really the 17th century, late 1600s. Uh, the Dutch I think were the first ones to build a fort along here. They built Fort Nassau at one of their Dutch settlements because remember North America was not always just a British colony. At periods it had um, colonists from the Netherlands and also from Sweden. So Fort Nassau was built along here in 1623. The Swedes further up at what's now Wilmington, Delaware was then Christiana, a Swedish colony. They built Fort Christiana in 1638. Um, the British built Fort Mifflin along here in 1771. So that's after the French and Indian War. Um, they were some co somewhat concerned that a French fleet in a subsequent war may sail into the Delaware River and come up to Philadelphia and threaten Philadelphia. So the British built defensive works here, um, earthwork redoubt with cannon mounted Fort Mifflin to uh, really the first fixed defense on the Delaware River. And then during the Revolutionary War, as this was an area that was hotly contested between the British and the Americans, um, Patriots built a Fort Mercer, um, also to protect the Delaware River and the approaches to uh, Philadelphia. And of course, General Howe would come by land, fight the Battle of Brandywine, defeat George Washington, and simply march into um, Philadelphia, but that prevented him from bringing his fleet up here with a direct route into the city. So many other forts along here during that colonial period, um, lots of them temporary, lots of them really just like um, earthworks and log emplacements, and most of those have been lost to history, either overbuilt or just faded back into the river as time has gone on. So there are very few remaining. It's not really until the War of 1812 between Britain and the United States that permanent harbour defences are really thought of in this area. So the War of 1812, there are land engagements in the War of 1812 out on the western frontier against uh, Tecumseh, the Indians, uh, who were in the British employ. Um, American forces tried to invade Canada and were repulsed. The British then retaliated by raiding Washington DC and Baltimore and trying to attack New Orleans. But most of the action during the War of 1812 was at sea, um, so a lot of naval engagements, but then also the Royal Navy sailed into the Chesapeake Bay and raided up and down the Chesapeake Bay and raided into the Delaware River and raided um, small towns and industrial sites up and down the American coast. And so after that War of 1812, um, the Americans really started to take river defences and coastal defences much more seriously and started to think about permanent forts. So the first permanent fort in this area is out there in the river on Peapatch Island, um, which is now Fort Delaware. At the time it was just a um, earthen and log star fort built in 1817. Then they began construction on a polygonal fort um, in the 1830s, but uh, as with typical government efficiency, there were cost overruns and building delays, uh, legitimate building delays, not just the contractor are trying to get more money. I mean, Peapatch Island is a swampy bit of land, so they had to sink wooden pilings in to support the fort, hence the cost overruns, and eventually Congress cut off money for that, and uh, the polygonal fort was never completed. But then we come to the 18. 40s and in the aftermath of the Mexican-American War they decide to have another go on Peapatch Island and they build the fort that's currently there at the moment, Fort Delaware, a pentagram, yeah five-sided fort, irregular pentagram, which is built out of brick and stone from Nice quarries over there on the 
in Maryland. Um, things like Port Deposit and, and Havid Grace have got big quarries there. And so it uh, looks like a white, looking out in the de in, across the river, looks like it's built of white brick, but it's actually white stone fronted and then red brick behind that. And so that was completed in 1860, just in time really for the Civil War, mounted with heavy cannon, Columbiad cannon. Um, the fort is open during the summer, limited hours for um, touring. So you can take the ferry across from Delaware City on the Delaware side. Or actually pick up the ferry here at Fort Mott. It's not running today because this is a Tuesday. It's certainly open Friday, Saturday and Sunday this week, I believe, during the summer months as well. So you can pick up the ferry and get out to Peapatch Island and take a tour of that. If you're out there at um, certain hours of the day, the reenactment gun crew will come up and fire this huge Columbiad cannon on the hour, um, which will rattle your bones and uh, uh, that's something to behold being close to that even with a small understrength charge in such a large coastal gun it's a pretty impressive sight so if you're in this area Pea Patch Island and Fort Delaware is a great place to visit so I am at Fort Mott at the moment so Fort Mott is across the Delaware River from Fort Delaware and Pea Patch um, on the New Jersey shore southern New Jersey on the bank of the Delaware River. So in 1872, the aftermath of the Civil War, they decided that they would build a supporting battery here. Um, the idea being that if the enemy landed on this river bank, you could place artillery on high ground here and fire on Fort Delaware. So they wanted to protect Fort Delaware from this bank and they built Fort Knott. They wanted to prevent, uh, protect Fort Delaware from the Delaware shore and they built Fort DuPont. So this was originally um, the battery at Finns Point. This part of the country was called Finns Point at that point. Uh -huh. um, later named Fort Mott. It was originally an earthwork fort in the 1870s. So earth redoubt mounted with heavy guns. And it served its purpose, but I mean, as an earth defense, Eventually, if you fire enough artillery into earthworks, they're going to shatter and evaporate and overturn your guns and kill your gun crews. So it wasn't particularly that great. So when you come around to the first Cleveland administration, so President Grover Cleveland, as you know, he was president, then he lost an election. So he sat out four years, then he ran for election again and won a second term. So in his first administration, his secretary of war, William Endicott, um, established the Endicott Board, a fortifications review of coastal and harbour defences throughout the United States. And there were several recommendations in that, and one of the recommendations was um, the establishment of a stronger fort here at Fort Mott. So that was going to be a brick construction, uh, reinforced eventually by a lot of concrete and stone, and then the brick would be and the fort would be hidden behind a giant earth berm. So if you look from the riverbank, or if you look from the middle of the river over here to Fort Mott, um, you'll see just a tiny, tiny um, rooftop tip of the fort. You won't see the actual wall. The wall is covered by an earth bank. It looks like, oh, kick the tripod. It looks like a, a natural feature. And uh, one of the ways they were able to do that was instead of having the guns mounted along the top of the fort where you'd see the guns, the guns are mounted on what they call disappearing carriages, so we'll talk about that later. So you couldn't see the guns from the river unless they were actually shooting at you. Um, so this was under construction. It was approved during the Cleveland administration. It was then much later, um, finally the funding came from it because not only were they building Fort Mott, of course, they were fit building forts up and down the east and the west coast and through the Panama Canal zone and when the Panama Canal was eventually um, completed. So there was a lot of building going on in the 1880s, 1890s, early 1900s. And so, you know, priority wise, you had to decide where the money was gonna go. So Fort Mott was built in its current configuration between 1896 and 1900, finally completed and put into action. It's named after Major General Gershom Mott, who was a New Jersey soldier 
a veteran of the Mexican-American War in the 1840s, a veteran of the Civil War in the 1860s, and in the 1870s he was commander of the New Jersey National Guard. So hometown hero, and that's who they decided they would name this fort after. So it's built to protect um, Fort Delaware from this New Jersey bank and also to provide downriver gunfire, assisting the guns at Fort Delaware. Um, the range of some of the guns here was upwards of 10 miles, so you could certainly fire down the estuary at anything that's approaching. Um, you wouldn't want to do that today, of course, because right in my line of sight is Salem Nuclear Power Station. So <laughs> You'd not want to hit that. Um, so this is an unusual fort from the period, Fort Mott. Uh, most of the harbour defences are built facing the coast or facing the river, as this one is. But this fort was also built to withstand an attack from the landward side, from the rear. So at the rear of Fort Mott, they built a Parados, which is an artificial hill. Um, so artificial high ground behind it with a moat in front of it and prepared that for um, defence from the rear. So if anybody landed either side of the fort or came up from the fort from behind and tried a, an infantry attack on the fort to overrun this fort, um, the fort was able to defend itself from the rear, um, either with uh, musketry, so good old-fashioned infantrymen or impressed artillerymen with rifles, at this point, of course, the Maxim gun is coming into play as well. And also two of the batteries here at Fort Mott mounted five-inch guns, which were on a 360-degree carriage mount, um, so they could be turned and face in any direction, including the rear. So if you were attacking, you'd also then come under five-inch artillery fire, which is going to be rather unpleasant for you. So Fort Mott was very well designed for um, offensive action and also defensive action. As I say, um, not all forts are designed like that. Most are just gun emplacements facing towards the coastal area with very little defence behind. So I'm actually sitting on top of one of the main batteries. I'm sitting on top of Battery Arnold. Um, Battery Arnold was mounted with three model... Now, are they 1895 or 1888? I'm going to say 1888, um, possibly 1895. I'll check that later in my notes. But mounted with three 12 inch guns, heavy, heavy guns, 12 inch guns, so battleship size guns. We're not talking about field artillery, we're talking about battleship size guns um, here, 12 inch guns. Those guns would fire a 975 pound shell, so think about that 975 pounds of solid armour piercing shell coming at you with a range of 18,400 yards, so 10 and a half miles. So these three guns could fire a Fiat 500 10 miles, um, which is phenomenally scary if you're on the receiving end of that. And as I say, this is one of the main batteries, and the purpose of this fort was to hit enemy ships coming up the river. And 10 miles down there, you could certainly do some serious damage with these guns firing armour-piercing shells. So alongside us then is Battery Harker, and that's the second main battery here. That mounted uh, two Model 1895 10-inch guns, so a slightly smaller gun, but also a good-sized gun. Um, if you go to World War II, uh, heavy cruiser only had an 8-inch, eight, eight 6-inch six or 8-inch gun, so a lot of those cruiser battles in uh, World War II were fought with smaller guns than were here. I mean, a 10-inch gun would be a uh, small pre-World War One, as this period was, battleship gun, um, and that would have been relegated then to heavy cruisers and eventually gone out of commission. But two 10-inch guns, so they would fire a 600-pound shell, and that had a good range of about 14,700 yards, so eight and a third miles. So if you came inside the shot line as a flotilla coming up the river, uh, Battery Arnold would engage you at a far distance and could continue engaging ships that were coming in at that distance but anybody who's coming through could still be engaged at a shorter distance uh, by Battery Harker. So I wanted to talk about disappearing gun carriages. 
these guns were not mounted on top of the fort. They were mounted in a well, well, a well, like a car like a deep well in which the gun would sit below line of sight. So about 30 feet below the top of the fort on a mechanism that um, allowed the crew to load the gun, make the gun ready. Um, the gun direction turrets would make the adjustments for fire and give the fire directions. And when the guns were ready to fire in battery, the carriage, the disappearing gun carriage, would rise up from this well. The gun would appear, it would come up automatically to the gun settings, it would fire, the gun would depress, and the carriage would go down and disappear. So the gun would come up, fire, and disappear. Reload, slow process for a 12-inch gun, come up, fire, disappear. Um, so that afforded the gun crew a lot of protection. And the gun was not exposed um, while it was being loaded, only exposed in that brief moment while it's firing, then disappeared below. The gun crew never had to come up with the gun. The gun crew were always down below in that casement. So there was a lot of protection given for them, a lot of protection given for the gun, and that meant that um, rounds of artillery rounds and powder sacks did not have to be brought up too high. They could be kept down in magazines well below ground level and brought up as needed. So it's a very, very um, solid defensive position that could withstand a lot of attack. If shells are bursting, if you're attacking this fort with armor-piercing shells trying to crack the um, brickwork, well, there's earth in front of us that buffers the brickwork and so that's going to blunt the effect of an armor piercing shell. If you're firing high explosive in to try and blow chunks out of the dirt but also then fire shell splinters hither and thither and shell splinters from a naval gun of the period could be as large as my fist or as, as large as my head or as large as my posterior. I mean, they could be like very, you know, small splinters as big as your thumb, but they could also be very large chunks of metal flying at subsonic speed, which if they caught you would, you know, eviscerate you. There's no other word for that. Um, so keeping the gun crew down below and, you know, if high explosive shells are hitting the top here and those shell splinters are going harmlessly over the top of this gun position and um, not affecting anybody. So want to quickly go through. Um, this was supported by two five-inch batteries um, that could traverse, as I said, 360 degrees. Um, those were um, additional batteries. There was also a three-inch gun battery which protected and really for anybody that tried to come up and sweep the minefields, that was for close in defensive work. They would deploy minefields in time of threat into the river. But um, the fort never fired a shot in anger. There was no attack on this in World War I. Um, after World War I, these guns were becoming obsolete. The army built a separate fort down at Fort Salisbury in Delaware, further down the river, which rendered this fort redundant, really. Um, the guns began to be removed. Some were removed for fortifications at other places, like the five-inch guns went to Hawaii, and the 10-inch guns were sent up to Canada. The 12 inch guns remained here in reserve. Um, so in the 1920s, this was decommissioned as a full time post. It was left with a caretaker staff, so a very small staff of non commissioned officers, ordnance sergeants, a few privates, just to maintain the facility and it wouldn't get out of, uh, um, out of hand. It was kept as a military post until 1943. When at that point they realised, well, the Germans are not coming and there's really no point in keeping this fort in uh, government hands anymore. We've got more on our plate. We need to be spending our money on other things. This is World War II, after all. And so the fort was transferred to New Jersey. And now New Jersey could have used this as a training post for the National Guard or something like that during the period, but New Jersey really had no use for it either. And decided in 1947 that they would start converting this into a state park which then opened in uh, 1951 and it's been a state park and a tourist attraction really since 1951. So there is, uh, there are no guns in place here today so you won't see those um, but the fort is in very very good condition you can walk around 
Um, you can't obviously get into the underground chambers because that would be unsafe. Uh, a lot of the drops are covered by solid safety fences, not the old chicken wire from when I first came up here, um, to prevent you falling down. Um, it's a beautiful location along the riverbank. As I say, during the summer you can catch the ferry across to Peapatch Island, visit Fort Delaware. There are picnic pavilions here, barbecue pits here, great place to come and picnic, um, exercise your dog, let your kids run up and down the fort. There are some other things in the area. Um, there, we're about an hour and a half from Atlantic City. We're about an hour from Valley Forge, if you want to valley, visit Valley Forge. We're about an hour and a half from Monmouth Battlefield, if you want to go and visit another Revolutionary War battlefield. Um, in Salem County, Saturday nights from May through September is the Cowtown Rodeo up at Penns Grove, um, the oldest continual rodeo in uh, weekly rodeo in, in the United States. So Saturday night rodeo in New Jersey, who would have thought that? Um, there's uh, New Jersey, we're in southern New Jersey, which really is down here, the Garden State. So a lot of produce stands um, up on Route 40, Graham's Farm Stand, that's a nice one. Uh, it's right next to that has got um, Laps Olympia Dairy Bar, so if you want some good soft serve ice cream or a gigantic cheeseburger then that's a good place to go as well, highly recommended. Get a burger, get a milkshake, visit the produce market, um, get some tomatoes are in season at the moment so get some of those big New Jersey tomatoes and uh, enjoy those. But So Fort Delaware, never fired a shot in anger, only in practice. Um, it was a deterrent, so we tend to think of deterrents now as the nuclear deterrent, that nuclear standoff between nuclear powers like Russia, China, um, United States, United Kingdom, France, who else has nuclear weapons deployed? That's probably it. Um, but that deterrent said, if you fire on me, I will fire on you. So we think of that in nuclear terms, but the psychological theory of deterrence obviously goes back further than that. If you put a big fort here on the river, um, that will dissuade people from coming up the river and trying to attack because they know they're going to be destroyed in the river before they even get up there. So why even try? Uh, these forts were a deterrent. They served their purpose. Um, the Germans certainly never tried to raid up here in World War I. They never tried to raid up here in World War II through the harbour defences. Um, so German submarines certainly patrolled off the east coast. Operation um, Drumbeat, the happy time in which submarines sank US ships off the Delaware coast and off the Virginia Capes and off the uh, North Carolina, but no Germans tried to sneak their way up the Delaware River and lay in wait and torpedo ships in the estuary because of the harbour defences that were built here and then further down the river in the 1920s and 1930s. So hope you enjoyed this brief little tour and little talk. I will walk around, I think, and take some additional video now um, after the live stream of the uh, disappearing gun wells and some of the positions that are visible and accessible here at Fort Mott. And I will post them as additions on the Facebook page to the live stream. So come on out to New Jersey, get some farm produce, grab yourself a hamburger. Come on out to Fort Mott and enjoy your summer. Uh, further tours coming up. Um, I believe next week we are out at Gettysburg again. And what will we be doing at Gettysburg? I think we will be out on Barlow's Knoll. So north of the town, 11th Corps, talking about the first day of the battle. And uh, a geographic feature out there north of Gettysburg that was fought over desperately on the afternoon of the 1st of July. So that's next week. We'll be out at Gettysburg for another live stream tour. Um, summer is upon us. Covid restrictions are leaving. Um, if you are thinking of touring some of these places, um, just drop me an email or a direct message or tweet me on any of the social media channels that we've got. Um, I would be happy to be bombed by this aircraft, I guess. Um, we'll be happy to um, provide private small group tours to uh, historical sites up and down the East Coast at the moment. I'm not travelling internationally at the moment. 
but certainly available for Antietam, Manassas, Valley Forge, Monmouth, Brandywine, um, Fort McHenry, all these places um, and more. Um, Gettysburg I won't do paid tours at, um, they have very good professional tours there, I don't want to step on their feet. Um, so any time I go to Gettysburg that's a free live stream tour from me to you. So that's really just for fun, all for free. Um, but if you want a tour, let me know. If you don't want a tour and you're saying like, hey, well, you know, David, I'm going to go visit Gettysburg. What do you think I should look at while I'm up there? Just send me a message and I'll let you have some suggestions on, um, you know, good places to eat, where you can get a good cheesesteak, where you can get a good hamburger, um, places that are open 24 hours, Lincoln Diner all day breakfast, 24 hours a day, that, that diner is open. So, um, you know, places to stay, things off the beaten track, so you're going to drive that tour route and you're thinking like, is there anything that's fun that we could go look at that's not on the route? And be like, sure, get out of your car, walk from here to here, and here's a secret place you can look at. So, all those things, you know, if you want a tour, that's great, be happy to provide that for you. Um, if you just like a little bit of advice because you're touring that place yourself, absolutely happy to provide that free of charge gratis and for nothing um, because I just want to share as much history and share as much love of these places that I have for these places with you as I can so hope you enjoyed the little chat today about uh, Fort Mott I'm gonna wrap up the live stream now and get to filming some additional video and photographs and post that all up on the Facebook page so thanks for coming see you later